We've been talking for the last three chapters about chemical reactions and chemical changes. Well, chemical reactions and chemical changes can't occur without energy. Energy is always involved. Either energy is released in a chemical process or energy is required to make that process happen. So in chapter seven, we're gonna learn all about the energy side of the equation. There's lots of different kinds of energy. One of the most common ones we'll deal with is called chemical potential energy, and that's what foods have. Each of these M&Ms in this jar has about two and a half calories of chemical potential energy. A gummy bear has about four calories of chemical potential energy. Almonds have quite a lot of potential energy because they have a lot of fats in them. Oils and fats are packed with chemical potential energy. We'll start out with a very fun demonstration in this chapter's lecture, which I call the, it's, well, it's called the, the howling gummy bear. I like to call it gummy bears in hell because it seems like that. We're going to release the energy in these gummy bears and some other food products in a very dramatic fashion. Lots of smoke, lots of flame. So I think you'll enjoy that one. So let's go ahead and get started on chapter seven and learn about the various types of energy and how energy is involved in chemical and physical changes. We've been discussing energy in class and the units that we measure it in, which is commonly either joules or calories. Calories, of course, is something you're well familiar with. Anytime we think about foods, we think about how many calories that particular food item contains. For example, this little red Skittle is probably about two calories. A gummy bear, on the other hand, might contain four calories of energy. That probably doesn't sound like a lot of energy. Considering the average person uses about 2,000 calories a day, and so this uh, small amount of energy might not seem like much, but in your body that energy is released very slowly. So we're going to do a little demonstration here where we release this energy very rapidly. In order to release the energy in a food item, you need oxygen. That's why we breathe oxygen. The oxygen is combined with the food and essentially is burning it in your cells. We're going to do that directly by using potassium chlorate. So potassium chlorate is a good source of oxygen and combine that with the carbon and hydrogen in these food items as our fuel, we can release that energy fairly quickly. Now in order to make that happen, first we need to melt the potassium chlorate. So we're going to fire up this burner, this large burner is called a Fischer burner. It's bigger than your normal Bunsen burner. So we'll light that up. And it's going to take a few minutes for that to melt. So we'll pause the video for a couple of minutes and we'll give this a chance to melt and then we'll come back and continue. All right, it looks like the potassium chlorate is essentially melted. So we'll turn off the burner and now we'll adjust the tube so it's vertical and let's go ahead and start seeing what some of these food items are like. So let's start out with a breath mint. That's probably two calories of energy there. Imagine that in your stomach. Alright, let's try a skittle. The chocolate has a lot of calories. Now these little nerd candies, they must only contain a fraction of a calorie. Let's see if they'd even do much of anything. Not bad. Little tiny things there. 
maybe that's a calorie of energy there. Now, sugar has a surprisingly large number of calories. Not as much as fat, however. Now this tortilla chip should have a lot of fat in it. Let's see what it does. Ah, there it goes. And that's just a little piece of a tortilla chip. Now, of course, the demonstration is named after the gummy bear, so let's put a gummy bear in here with four calories. Four calories is surprisingly quite a bit of energy. So the next time you're popping gummy bears, you're remembering this. Now while that's still nice and hot, let's add an almond. Almonds are sort of difficult to get to ignite. Fats take a lot of heat to get them going, but once they start, they have a lot of energy. So let's see if we can get that almond to ignite here. Oh, there it's starting. Come on, almond. Well, I know how we can speed that almond up here. Now, when you were a little kid, perhaps you used to chew on erasers. And you thought, well, how many calories can an eraser have? Well, the answer is it's got a lot of calories, but your body can't use it. Erasers are sort of like a solid form of gasoline. Oh, it looks like our almond has decided to ignite. Whew. You can see when fat burns, it gets very bright. Fats have double the energy and more than things like sugar do. But let's finish it up with our eraser. Even though there's no calories in here your body can use, it does have a lot of calories. time you're chewing on your eraser, remember this. The next time you eat a candy bar, the label says 250 calories, and you remember these things that have two or three calories, just imagine what would happen if we dropped a Snickers bar in that test tube. I think I would want to be running the other direction. Back at the beginning of the semester, we described chemistry of the, as the study of matter and the changes it undergoes. But those changes can't occur without energy. Essentially, energy makes things happen. Any kind of process, whether it's physical or chemical, requires energy. Either the energy will be needed in the process or energy will be produced in the process. To launch the space shuttle into orbit requires energy, which comes from the rocket fuel. To turn the turbines on those giant windmills out on the delta 
energy comes from the wind. And living things, like this Olympic athlete, need energy in order to lift those heavy weights. There are two basic types of energy. The one you're probably the most familiar with is kinetic energy. Essentially, kinetic energy is just energy of motion. Any object that's moving has kinetic energy. Kinetic energy depends simply on two things, how much mass a particular object has and how fast it's moving. A bullet fired from a gun has a lot of kinetic energy. Even though the bullet doesn't weigh very much, it's moving very rapidly. A bowling ball is moving at a much slower speed than our bullet, but it is much more massive. So the bowling ball also has a huge amount of kinetic energy. The other type of energy is called potential energy, which is commonly referred to as stored energy. Potential energy is not as obvious. An object can be sitting at rest and not doing anything in particular, but still contain a huge amount of stored or potential energy. The energy in an object can be stored in a number of different ways. Probably the most important one for us is chemical potential energy. Chemical energy is stored in the chemical bonds in various chemical compounds, and that energy can be released in chemical reactions where bonds are being broken and formed. One of the most important types of chemical potential energy is fuel. So whether it's gasoline, natural gas, propane, wood, or coal, all of these materials contain a large amount of chemical potential energy, and that energy can be released by burning or by combustion. Of course, equally important, or more so, really, for us, is food. Food has a lot of stored chemical potential energy. Does anybody know the units that we use to measure the chemical potential energy in food? Yes, it's calories. So the number of calories in a particular food item is simply the amount of chemical potential energy stored in that particular food. Now, batteries, you might think, would be electrical potential energy. And that is one of the types of potential energy. But in reality, batteries don't contain any electricity at all. If you cut open a battery, you won't get shocked because there's no electricity in that battery. What there are are chemical compounds. And when you connect the two terminals of the battery, a chemical reaction will occur and it will produce electricity. Does anyone happen to know what kind of chemical reaction produces electricity? And the answer, of course, is a redox reaction. Redox reactions involve the gain and loss of electrons. The key in a battery is that the chemical that's losing and the chemical that's gaining electrons are separated from each other. And the only way the electrons can get from one point to the other is to travel through an external wire, through whatever device the battery happens to be powering. Another type of potential energy is gravitational potential energy. Gravity makes things want to fall from a, a higher point to a lower point. So anything that has the ability to fall from a higher elevation to a lower elevation has gravitational potential energy. We use that a lot in the United States to generate electricity. Hydroelectric dams hold water and that water is allowed to flow downhill and as it flows downhill it spins turbines on large generators to produce electricity. An avalanche, there's been a lot of avalanches this winter throughout the California and Colorado and an avalanche basically the snow is at a high elevation and it wants to go to a lower elevation. So that snow has a lot of gravitational potential energy. A cuckoo clock, not all of you may be familiar with a cuckoo clock. They're the ones with the little bird that pops out once an hour and says cuckoo. But those clocks are powered by weights. Those large black weights you see hanging under the clock 
gravity makes those slowly fall, and as those weights fall, they spin the gears inside the clock and make the hands move. When the weights get low, you simply pull them back up again, giving them more gravitational potential energy, and the clock will continue to run. The most powerful source of potential energy is nuclear potential energy. And as the name implies, nuclear potential energy is stored in the nucleus of the atom. I mentioned earlier that chemical potential energy is stored in the bonds in chemical compounds. And nuclear potential energy is stored in the bonds in the nucleus, those bonds connecting the neutrons and the protons. The bonds in the nucleus are millions of times stronger than chemical bonds, which is why nuclear potential energy is millions of times stronger than chemical potential energy. The greatest source of nuclear potential energy we have is the Sun. The Sun is basically a giant nuclear reactor. The Sun is continually converting hydrogen into helium, and as it does so, it releases an enormous amount of energy, which heads out into space, and a small amount of that energy hits the Earth, and we use that energy to make plants grow, we eat the plants, so most of our energy indirectly comes from the Sun. We also use nuclear power plants. This is a picture of Three Mile Island. You know, none of you are probably old enough to remember that, but back in 1979 they had a nuclear disaster there, but luckily all of the material was enclosed in a, in, a, in, a, in a large concrete dome, and it kept the radiation from escaping, unlike what happened in Chernobyl a few years later. And of course, nuclear weapons, you know, the, the, the bad side of that coin, unfortunately, is we can use nuclear power you know, to benefit mankind by producing electricity, but it also makes a very terrible weapon. Elastic potential energy, sometimes called mechanical potential energy, has been around for a very long time. A lot of kids' toys are powered by that. Anything that you can stretch or twist or bend, and it wants to unstretch and untwist and unbend, has elastic potential energy. For example, a mouse trap. When you set the mouse trap, you're bending that spring, and that spring wants to snap back, so it has elastic potential energy. One of my favorite toys as a kid, back in the days before video games, were these rubber band powered balsa wood airplanes. They were so much fun. You'd wind that rubber band up, storing elastic potential energy, and then it would power the propeller, and those planes would fly all over the place. And, of course, a more recent toys, or my kids, were the Nerf guns. They have springs in them, and when you, when you pull those springs back, they get a lot of elastic potential energy. And, of course, they want to pop back into their original form and launch those little Nerf darts. The last type of potential energy is electrical potential energy. Now, we said earlier that batteries don't actually store electricity, but it is possible to store electricity directly. Probably the example you're most familiar with is lightning. Lightning is basically static electricity. So that the charges build up on the clouds and eventually they have to balance each other out with the ground and so the lightning travels between the clouds and the ground to balance those huge electrical charges. And of course you've probably encountered stati static electricity as well this is particularly common back in the Midwest. When I was a kid, again, you know, back in the Midwest, when it gets really cold and dry, that's when static electricity is at its best. And so we used to have a lot of fun in the wintertime when it would get very dry and cold, and you could really make your hair stand on end. And finally, for you Back to the Future fans, let's go all the way back to 1985 and the famous flux capacitor. A capacitor is basically a device that stores electricity. It's a real thing. I mean, the flux capacitor, of course, was, uh, was a bit of science fiction, but most electrical devices, your cell phones, any computer, your televisions, they all contain capacitors to store electricity. It's possible, and actually quite common, to convert one form of energy into another. You can change various kinds of potential energy into other types of potential energy, 
And you can also go back and forth between kinetic and potential. So for example, consider a coal-fired power plant. We start out with coal, which has a lot of chemical potential energy. You burn that coal, and that chemical potential energy is turned into thermal energy, which is basically just the kinetic energy of fast-moving atoms and molecules. The heat from the coal is used to boil water and convert it to steam. So the steam basically has more thermal energy, or kinetic energy, than the original water. The steam is then used to spin a turbine. So the kinetic energy of the steam is converted to the kinetic energy of this moving turbine, and the moving turbine then produces electricity. And electricity is really a form of kinetic energy as well. The electricity coming out of your electrical outlets at home is simply electrons moving at a very high rate of speed. And it's those fast-moving electrons, it's their kinetic energy that powers your various devices. Now we can finish this up by going full circle and going back to chemical potential energy. If you use the electricity to charge your cell phone battery, you're basically carrying out a chemical reaction inside that battery. So we've gone from the chemical potential energy in the coal through all these various changes, and now we're back to the chemical potential energy of the battery. The downside of all of this, of course, is that every time you convert one form of energy to another, you lose energy, sometimes a significant amount. So the energy of the coal, by the time you get to your cell phone, you've lost a large percentage of that energy you had initially. So it's always good to have as few of these transformations as possible. It turns out that not only can one form of energy be converted into another, but matter can actually be converted into energy, and vice versa. Because mass and energy are basically two forms of the same thing. Einstein was the first person to figure this out from his theory of relativity when he came up with his famous equation E equals mc squared, which I'm sure all of you have heard of at one time or another. So in his equation, E is the amount of energy that you can get. M is the mass of the, of the material that's being converted to energy. And C is the speed of light, which we square. How much energy is needed to power the entire Earth for one year? Well, we would have to burn 24 billion tons of coal. Or if we used nuclear power, we would only need 7,000 tons of uranium. But if we could somehow convert matter directly into energy, it would only take 7 tons of matter. You could put that easily in the back of a, a semi-trailer and a truck, and that would be enough material to power the Earth for an entire year. The problem is it's very difficult to change matter directly into energy. It can be done, but only on a very small scale. The only place I know that it's ever been done on a large scale is on one of my all-time favorite TV shows, which is Star Trek, because the power source of the various incarnations of the Starship Enterprise all were based on converting matter directly into energy by using something called antimatter. But that's a story for another day. Now we discussed earlier that energy can either be potential or kinetic, but sometimes an object can have both. So on your quizzes and exams, if both of them are present, you're going to need to be able to decide which one is more abundant. So I'm going to give you some examples here so that you'll be able to make that choice correctly. Okay, a stick of dynamite. A dynamite's an explosive, which means it has a lot of chemical potential energy. Now suppose that stick of dynamite was thrown through the air. If someone threw a stick of dynamite across the room, it has still got its potential energy, but it also has some kinetic energy. So imagine this. If the stick of dynamite hit the wall and didn't blow up, 
how much damage would it do? The answer is not much. It might make a little dent in the wall. But if it hit the wall and blew up, it would blow the entire wall down. So the chemical potential energy is clearly much greater than the little bit of kinetic energy it has flying through the air. Okay, what about Usain Bolt running the 100 meter dash in the Olympics? When Usain is running, he's got a lot of kinetic energy. That's true because he's moving very fast. But where did that kinetic energy come from? The answer is it came from the chemical potential energy he had stored in his body. Imagine how many times he could run the 100 meter dash before he collapsed, exhausted, and out of fuel. Probably hundreds of times. He might have to rest in between, but he could run that same race many, many times over and over again. Each time, he could only have a certain amount of kinetic energy from his speed, but since he could do it many times, he must have many more times chemical potential energy to allow him to do that over and over again. So his potential energy clearly outweighs his kinetic energy. A rock thrown at a window, that's sort of like the stick of dynamite, except the rock really doesn't have any stored energy. It's just inert minerals. So the rock has kinetic energy. It'll certainly break the window when it hits it, but it doesn't really have any of the various types of potential energy, so this would be an example of kinetic energy. Your car driving down the freeway, sort of like the Usain Bolt example. The car has a lot of kinetic energy, clearly. If you ran into something, there would be an enormous amount of kinetic energy. But once again, where did that kinetic energy come from? And the answer is it came from the gasoline in the tank. You could pull off the side of the freeway and then accelerate back to 75 miles an hour a whole lot of times before you ran out of fuel, unless you were on fumes to start with. So you have a lot of chemical potential energy, enough to reach that 75 miles an hour of kinetic energy many times. So clearly, the potential energy in the fuel tank outweighs the kinetic energy that the car has. The key thing is whether the object that's moving also has a large store of potential energy of some type in it. Rain falling from a cloud. Rain is basically just water. You know, water doesn't burn. It's got no electricity. It really doesn't have any uh, of the normal kinds of potential energy. But in this case, it does have gravitational potential energy because it can fall all the way down from that cloud. So if the rain is up in the cloud just falling, then it's got a lot of gravitational potential because it has a long way to fall. Now the raindrop just before it hits the ground, almost all of that gravitational potential energy has been converted into um, kinetic energy. So I would have to be very specific. A raindrop just before it hit the ground would be mostly kinetic energy. A raindrop just falling from the cloud, that would be mostly gravitational potential energy. Now the example I gave about Usain Bolt a few minutes ago applies to all living things. I mean, any living thing is going to have a huge amount of stored chemical potential energy. You can move around all day long if you want, and if you don't have to eat, you still have the energy to survive. People can, can live without food for several weeks as long as they have water because they have a lot of stored chemical potential energy. So this observation gives rise to what I like to call Phil's first law, at least first law for chapter 7, which basically says that all living things have more potential than kinetic energy. So if you're taking a quiz or exam and it's a living thing, whether it's an animal, a plant, a person, doesn't make any difference, your answer is going to be potential energy. As I said earlier, all processes involve energy. Whether it's a chemical change or a physical change, energy is always either going to be needed to make the process happen, or energy is going to be produced in the process. An exothermic process 
is a process that releases energy. So exothermic is like energy exiting or leaving the process. Wood burning, for example. When wood burns, there's a lot of heat given off, a lot of light. Clearly, it's an exothermic process. A ball rolling down a hill. If you roll a bowling ball down a hill and you stand at the bottom of the hill in front of it, you will immediately know it's releasing a lot of energy when it hits you. An acid-base reaction, you've done several acid-base reactions, and acid-base reactions always get nice and warm. So an acid-base reaction is going to release energy as well. And rain falling, we used that as an example a couple of minutes ago. The rain falling is going from a higher elevation to a lower elevation, so it is losing its gravitational potential energy. Basically, it's releasing that gravitational potential energy. There are also endothermic processes which require energy. So any process that takes energy in order to make it happen, that's an endothermic process. Pumping up a bicycle tire, it takes energy from you to pump that tire up. Grilling a hamburger, any kind of cooking is endothermic. Whether you use a microwave, your grill, the stove, or the oven, the job of all of those devices is to put energy into your food. So cooking is always an endothermic process. Raking leaves, they don't just rake themselves. It takes energy from you. Just like pumping that bicycle tire, you have to put energy into that rake to move those leaves into a pile. Life. Okay? Life is endothermic. Living things need energy. That's why we eat. Plants need sunlight. We eat the plants, or animals eat the plants, and we eat the animals. But living things always require a fairly consistent input of energy. If you cut that energy off, the living things will die. Wood burning, a ball rolling down a hill, an acid-base reaction, and rain falling. What do all of these exothermic processes have in common? And the answer is that once the process starts, they continue on their own. If you light a piece of wood, that wood will continue to burn on its own. If you get a ball started rolling down the hill, it will continue to roll down the hill. You don't have to keep pushing it. Gravity will make it go down the hill on its own. An acid-base reaction, once you mix that acid and base together, they are going to keep reacting because acids and bases always react. Once a raindrop falls out of a cloud, it's going to keep falling till it reaches the ground because gravity is pulling it down. Okay, how about the other four? Pumping up a bicycle tire, grilling a hamburger, raking leaves, and life. What do these endothermic processes have in common? The answer is they only continue as long as energy is added. Each of those processes needs energy, so when you stop providing the energy, the process ceases. A bicycle tire will not pump itself. As long as you keep pumping, air will go in. As soon as you stop, the process ends. If you turn off the heat on the grill, the hamburger will quit cooking. If you stop raking leaves, the leaves are just going to sit there in the yard. And of course, if we quit, if we just quit adding energy to living things, life will cease. So a process which once started continues on its own is called a spontaneous process. So spontaneous means, we usually think of spontaneous as something that simply happens on its own. But in science, the word spontaneous means that a process once begun will continue on its own. So for example, a sheet of paper is not going to light itself on fire. But if we light the sheet of paper, it will continue to burn. That makes it a spontaneous process. So a process doesn't have to start all by itself to be spontaneous. It simply has to continue on its own once we give it that little 
push to get it started. So my second law basically says that all spontaneous processes are exothermic. You'll notice that all four of the exothermic processes that we looked at, they all happen on their own. Once they're started, they continue. They're spontaneous. The four endothermic processes that we looked at did not occur spontaneously. As they continued as long as we pushed them by adding energy. As soon as we stopped adding energy, they stopped. They stopped. So all spontaneous processes are exothermic with one little provision until chapter 15. At the end of the semester, when we get to chapter 15, we're going to find out that there is an unusual case in which an endothermic process can be spontaneous. It's pretty strange because endothermic processes are basically going uphill. We don't expect a ball to roll uphill by itself. We don't expect raindrops to go from the ground up into the clouds. But there is one kind of endothermic process that actually will happen spontaneously. So we'll talk about that later on in the semester when we get to chapter 15. Like any quantity, whether it's length, mass, or volume, measuring something like energy requires units. For energy, one of the common units that we use is the calorie. The calorie was, was devised about a hundred years ago, and it's simply the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. Now, the calorie is not commonly used in science. The scientific unit is the joule. And the joule was developed independently of the calorie, so at some point they had to come up with a conversion between the two. And it turns out that there are just over four joules in a calorie. Now, the calorie that you're used to dealing with is the one that measures food calories. And that's not the same as a scientific calorie. A food calorie, which we usually represent with a capital C, equals a thousand of our scientific calories. Or we can simply refer to it as one kilocalorie. Now let's suppose that we wanted to use some energy to heat a pan of water. How much energy would be required to heat that water up to the boiling point? Well, the first thing we would need to know is how much water are we trying to heat? A large pan of water will take more energy than a small saucepan. The second thing we need to know is how many degrees are we trying to heat the water? If we start with cold water, we have more degrees to go to get to the boiling point than if we started with hot water. It turns out there's a third factor that also affects how much energy is required to increase the temperature of a substance, and that's called its specific heat. You can think of it as how hard is it to heat a substance. Some materials heat up very easily, some things heat up very slowly. Water happens to be very slow to heat. In the uh, springtime, in the summer, it's, you, even though it's been nice and warm outside, it might be 90 degrees out, the water in your swimming pool might only be 75 degrees. It won't be very warm because water has a very high specific heat. It takes a lot of energy to heat it up. Things like metals tend to have very low specific heats. They're easy to heat up and they're quick to cool down. So the definition of specific heat is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a substance by one degree Celsius. So it's almost the same as the definition of a calorie, except instead of using the word heating up a gram of water, we're heating up one gram of any substance. The specific heat of water is then very simply one calorie per gram degree Celsius. It takes one calorie to heat one gram of water by one degree. Now, as I mentioned earlier, metals tend to have very low specific heats. The specific heat of gold is only about three hundredths of a calorie per gram degree Celsius. So it takes very little energy to heat gold up, and it takes a lot of energy to heat water. For example, if we took a pound of water and we added to that 1,000 calories of energy, the temperature would only go up by a little over two degrees. 
If we took a pound of gold and added that same 1,000 calories, the temperature would rise by a little over 73 degrees. So gold increases in temperature about 30 times faster than water.